we got to the Marcy Armory, you know, the kind of nature of the film changed because we came back to something that we're more comfortable with. You're in a studio, uh, you're on a set, you're not dealing with weather. It was very complicated because we were dealing with this huge three-story, 70, 80-foot tall building. It was just a great setting and a great location to be in after really being out exposed to the forces of nature to suddenly take it and be completely safe and protected. Marcy Armory is 90 feet tall. Uh, without any columns, and 300 feet, the two big spaces, but the bigger space, about 300 feet long. Um, and that more or less just fit our arc. You know, a, a big engineering event for a movie. Hundreds of thousands of dollars just in framing, just in steel work, uh, to hold this thing up, which also had to hold the crew up. There were days where there was you know, four, 400 people maybe working just on the construction of the arc alone, which is a huge number. By hollowing out the three levels vertically by creating a heating core, we also were able to show the height. And, and when we constructed the interior of the ark on stage, uh, we left we built it that way so that the family lives by the furnace, but 40 feet over the bottom of the ark. That's a dangerous place to be. Hi, how was? You start in here. You can start with looking back, and then you just go for it. All right. Cleveland. I had the hearth and I had the presence of fire. I knew where my light was going to come from. But to try to sneak it into the further areas, I mean, there's no real wilds uh, in the ceiling that really made sense. And trying to make it all look real is very difficult. It was a big challenge, actually. And then, you know, the space where Tubal Cain is hiding, the reptile deck. I struggled with that because I, you know, I try to lean towards a source that makes sense. And I try, I, I've always leaned towards a source that I would see in the shot. On, on this particular instant, I had to kind of learn to love not seeing the source and letting the audience believe that, you know, there's enough shots in the movie that you see where the light's coming from, and when you feel that light in another part of the arc, it just makes sense. So you wake up, bang. Wake up for the attack, right? Yeah, you got to get it. It's going to be rare. And you see the snakes in the up. And yeah. Ow. All right, here we go. Stand by, camera going up, and on the bell. So to speak. One forty nine apple take three. Hey, Mark. Set. Set. Action. <laughs> Now we cut. That's the cut. That's 
Oh, it's okay. Like he, he's on. Then he'll hit it with the hard thing. Uh, let's try with a soft thing first, okay. and then we can do it. Who's gonna pop it? How does it pop it? In? Uh, somebody can push, uh, pull on this, and it's gonna help like reset it. Okay. Yeah, let's try with the soft thing. Have a few takes with that, and then we can do uh, the hard thing. Let's try. It. Okay. You know what? It's just. Pull harder, pull harder. I never walk. I never walk. I never, I've never walked like this in five. Crunch. You know? Yeah, you don't have to say. All the rest of it is really clunky. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. We can do this. Yeah. This is showing the wrong. Okay, heads up. Thank you, Kyle. Ladies and gentlemen, your tubal cane. One-legged warrior. Put your left hand on there. Here to hold it in place. Like you're grabbing your thigh to calm it. That seems a little extreme. Does it have to be that broken? I'm going to hit it. I'm just going to yeah. use this to raise it. Yeah. Yeah. I've got it there. That's basically it. Yeah, lift up that leg. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Don't touch his knob, he gets very sensitive. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. That's okay, kid. Hey, how come it's okay when he does it? Well, you scratch my knee while you're there. Yeah, careful, you're standing up there. Oh, keep doing that. <laughs> Alright, let's try it. Alright, picture off. Oh. <coughs> let's go bloody. Bloody and sweaty. Oh, bloody. So have your hand there, have all the force on it so nothing shifts, and all you gotta do is the whack and go into the pain, and we're good to go. And, okay. camera, rolling. Still got it easy? Speedy. 171 Charlie, take two, Amer. And, set. With will, and courage, we shall survive. One, two, three. Good. That was pretty awesome. And cut. I think it's a very powerful story. I think flood myths are powerful, but I think the no story is very powerful and it's deeply embedded in our culture. But I think the fact that it is about a God that we want to think is good and loves us, destroying every one but eight people. That's all, I think that's just a hard thing for people to keep in their heads. And so it's much easier for them to think about, oh, here's a nice guy who saved the animals. What did you say? They're not all soldiers. They're on, that's fine. They are not all soldiers. Well, it's oh, it's like, what? It's, it's pouring. And there is a, there's a few mountaintops out there, potentially, with people hanging on to the tops, like one of those great Dory paintings I probably showed you at the beginning of all this. And, um, there's a lot of bodies in there. I don't think there's actual bodies right here of people waving, <coughs> going, help us, help us. There's none of that happening. Okay. Noah! Ropes! We can drag ropes! They're not all soldiers, Father. Just people. I don't, but I don't understand the bother about having to close them. Yeah, it's, we'll it's our only vent. We know. Well, they're only ever. Yeah, but I, th I think five, there's still people screaming. If it's there's still people crying and screaming for help. There's still people alive. We're five days out. That a story that is that dark has been the place where it's lodged in kind of pop consciousness is for toddlers. You know, that it's a kid's story. When it, what it's about is God gets, kills everybody on the planet, essentially. And amongst those people that he killed that are die in the flood. It doesn't say it explicitly, but if you start to think about it for a second, there's grandmas and grandpas and newborn infants and sure, there, I'm sure there's probably a lot of wicked people doing wicked things, but amongst that, 
there are all these other people, all of whom, except for no one in his family, are, are killed. And that's a pretty broad judgment on humanity as a species. And it's a pretty strong thing to do. So we wanted to find a way to dramatize that. So what, what is it like? What, what does that mean? Make people feel that. And action. And cut. Good. That was a good one. We'll try it again. There's not much of a character in the in the actual Bible story for Noah. It calls him a righteous man in his time, and he's given this thing to do, and he does it. We looked into what the word righteous means, and a lot of biblical scholars came back to us and they said, most people think it's a balance between justice and mercy. It, it's something that as a parent, you can really understand. If you have too much justice with a child and you're too strict, you can destroy your child. If you have too much mercy as a parent and, and you sort of are very lax with them, you can destroy your child as well. And being a good parent is a balance of justice and mercy. And at the beginning of the story, it's very clear that the Creator wants justice, that he's very upset about the wickedness of man and how man has destroyed the planet. He wants to do something about it and he's very just. And at the very end of it, with the rainbow, it's clearly an act of mercy where he says, okay, I won't ever do something so horrendous to you again. The no story in the Bible, Noah does not speak. It just says, and Noah did, as he was told, as God commanded him. So who is this character? What is this story about? What do we feel it's about? And how do we do it in a way that can be a movie that you can dramatize, that has characters you care about? You know, one of the fundamental things that we came to was like, this is a story about whether humanity should be destroyed or saved. The, the thing that makes man a god, if you like, and I think this is what Tobal Cain thinks, is that you can create life, but you also have the power to take life away. And I think the point from Tobal Cain is that animals were put on this earth for us to eat, to harvest. And Noah wants to save the animals, but will cull his own people, in fact, exterminate his own people. So who's the good guy and who's the bad guy here? God looked at people and saw that their hearts were filled with wickedness, and he decided to destroy them. And it ends, and it says, and God said he would never destroy people again, even though. So there's this change of what do we do with the fact that people are flawed? Do we wipe them out, or do we find a way to try and strive for redemption. That is my child. If you should bear a girl, in the moment of her birth, I will cut her down. Okay, Kiko. Hey! Hey! Action! If it is a girl, my mature into a mother, she must die. That is my child. If you should bear a girl in the moment of her birth, I will cut her down. There's a madness about him as well. You know, it's like someone coming into a church today and saying, on an Easter and saying, I've risen again, I am the Son of God. You know, we'll probably find the police. When God said to Noah, hey, I'm going to destroy the world, how come Noah didn't say, God, don't do it. There's good people. Because when God goes to Abraham and says, you know, I'm going to destroy these cities, Abraham, Abraham says, well, no, if I can find you a hundred good guys, will you not destroy it? He pleads. Well, Abraham is representative of mercy. And Noah, well, he's more from a place of judgment because he follows God's will, but he doesn't try and save anyone. He, he just allows that judgment to take place. The very end of it, he, the first thing he does is get drunk. You know, that, that was a very interesting thing. It's the first mention of wine in the Bible, and it made us wonder what exactly that was that all about. But to us, when we looked at it, kind of taking a step back and just in, from a human psychological terms, it's the greatest case of survivor's guilt you could imagine. He's witnessed all that death and he's had a hand in all that death, whether actively or passively. 
because he's the one who, who was saved. I think Tilbal Kane is, has got a point. Well, I kind of think he's the alter ego of um, Noah. I mean, they, they come from the same place. They all, they're all from God, all made in his image. And God has made us what we are. And that includes Noah. Then God leaves them, forsakes them, and wants to exterminate them. From a point of view of humanity and for human race to actually survive, Tilbal Kane's got a point. But the reflection that we're going for on this film is the kind of thing of what man is actually doing to the planet. And Tilbal Kane's voice of reason is the voice of reason that we say um, time after time again. But yeah, but this has happened before. When are we ever going to learn? When are we going to change? So I think that's the voice of the film. I think the voice of Tilbal Kane is the voice of so-called reason. We just gotta fix this now. Okay, uh, Derek's coming in. Let's get some of these. What are we, uh. <laughs> Damn life, Pam. Well, it's a different thing. Okay. But it's fun. It's a fun thing. What's going on in your mind? Could have gone ahead. Shadowing the Okay, and set. Hey, action! And break. And cut. What was that shadow? Oh, it's the shadow man. Not 100% that sure. That was that for you, right? I saw it too. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> not as good as it was for you, right? Okay. Hey, I'm you not better sure. leave it. Yeah. All right, let's go get this. Anyway. Uh, I'm not leaving her yet. <laughs> All right, guys. One, one last one for good luck. Thank you. Good luck for who? <laughs> All right. Uh, all right, what do we need to change? What do we need to do? You watched the whole of mankind perish. All their innovations, all their creations. My people, your blood. Just washed away. Well, now we're finishing. Now! <laughs>